Hello there and welcome back to another computer science video. You thought you got rid of me, you didn't. We've moved to a new exam board. We're now looking at OCR, which is the OCR H446 specification. And this presentation will do AS and A2 as well. So let's move on and look at this video all about unit one or 1.1, which is the characteristics of contemporary processors, input, output, and storage devices. Three subject areas in here, the structure and function of the processors, the type of processors we use, and also input, output, and storage. Nice and easy to kick us off. So if we look at the specification from 1.1.1, the structure and function of a processor, it boils down into four key parts if you're doing AS, or five key parts if you're doing A2, the full qualification. So part A will look at all the different component parts of the central processing unit, Part B looks at the fetch decode execute cycle in detail. And then part C is factors affecting the performance of CPU. So it's actually listed clock speed, number of cores, and cache being the three factors there. And if you're doing A2, then you need to talk about pipelining, understand that process and how it improves efficiency. And then the last part there, von Neumann, Harvard, and contemporary architecture. So the three main architectures that we need to know. So let's jump straight in then. So there's two major component parts inside the CPU. The first one is the arithmetic logic unit, also known as the ALU. It performs all arith arithmetic, arithmetic operations. So that's addition, subtraction, multiplication, division on fixed numbers and floating point numbers as well. More on that later on as we move through the specification. Also, it performs logical operations. So all things logic could be and or, exclusive or and not gates. In addition to that, it performs comparison operations. So if you know anything about programming, comparison operations are really important in things like selection statements, which work out if something is true or false, for example. So everything logic goes to the ALU. Now the control unit is another major component and what it does is it controls and coordinates activities of the CPU. It'll direct the flow of data between the CPU and other devices at the same time by sending control signals across the entire motherboard. Now, during program execution, it's given the next instruction. It decodes the instruction into a series of sequential or ordered steps, and it manages the execution of these steps and keeps control of everything that goes on there. Also, it'll copy any result back to memory or registers as required, and it's important that we keep track of all those um, pieces of data because if not, it'll ruin our processing order, and that'll be an absolute nightmare. So inside the CPU, we've got a number of registers that we use, and it might look like there's quite a lot there, but if you master the fetch decode execute cycle, all of these registers will be used. And as we refer to registers, we're talking about very small, very fast memory locations inside the CPU, and each of them have a specific purpose. So at first, we've got the PC, the program counter. Now that's the first um, register that comes into play when we talk about the fetch decode execute cycle. It stores the address of the next instruction to be executed, and its job is to keep track of where we are in the current instruction set. The accumulator stores the results of calculations from the ALU, so this is located on or near the ALU inside the CPU. We've got memory address registers also known as the MAR, and that stores the address of the instruction being read, the address of the data being used, or the address of where data should be stored. And obviously, the MAR uses the address bus to get across um, to and from random access memory, and we've got memory data registers. They store the actual instruction or data being fetched from memory, or data being written to memory. And again, the MDR uses the data bus. The current instruction register, also known as the CIR, stores the current instruction being executed. as two things, the operand and the opcode. More on that a little bit later. Data bus, three different types of buses. The data bus, known as, the, as a bidirectional bus, which means data can flow both ways, carries the actual data and instructions from one place to the other. So the MDR will use the data bus to get across from the CPU to RAM and back. The address bus is unidirectional, so we just go and 
find addresses, so transmits the address of the instruction or the data to be read or written. The control bus, again another bi-directional bus, will transmit control signals from the control unit to coordinate component access to the address and the data buses. So they're some of the major components that we've got in our CPU. Now again this is just a summary, um, so now let's put it in some context. We've got the fetch, decode, execute cycle and I tell my students if you know this order and, and you can expand on this order they could ask a large mark question in the exam and you'd be absolutely fine. So the first one is the fetch stage. What happens in the fetch stage? Well addresses are loaded from random access memory into the program counter and it keeps track of where the first instruction is. So the program counter points to the first address and then it passes the address over to the memory address register. After that, the program counter increments by one and that allows it to go on and continue doing its own thing. The addresses that are now stored in the memory address register travel along the address bus and the control unit sends a read signal from the control bus in the CPU across the control bus and it meets wherever the address is trying to be fetched from. The instructions are read from the address on the address bus and then the instruction is then passed along the data bus via the MDR. So the instruction on the data bus gets passed into the MDR, the MDR then copies the instruction into the current instruction register. So just to recap there, program counter points to instruction, that gets passed to the MAR, the MAR goes, finds the address, read signal comes from control unit, we read the information, we pass that information back via the MDR on the data bus, and then we copy the instruction into the current instruction register. Once it's in the current instruction register, we then start the decode phase. Now the current instruction register is split into op an opcode and an operand. So we take a binary number and we split it into opcode and operand. The opcode is part of that binary number or part of the instruction that tells the processor what should be done. So that would be a command, either an addition, subtraction, a load, a store command, even a halt command or a branch command, for example. The operand is the part of the instruction that contains the data to be acted on or the memory location of the data in the register. So opcodes act on the operand. We do the doing thing to the data. And that's what happens in the execution phase or the execute phase. The opcode is executed on the operand. The ALU carries out operations during this stage because it's logic and arithmetic operations that need to be done. The accumulator is always being used. It stores values used in the program at this stage. And it, in the accumulator, you can host a number of different things. So when values are inputted by the user, it uses the accumulator. When values are loaded from memory, it uses the accumulator. When values are outputted to the user, it comes from the accumulator. When values are written to memory, that comes from the accumulator also. And addition adds a value from memory to whatever is in the accumulator. So it keeps a running total. Subtraction will also subtract a value from memory from whatever's in the accumulator. So it's important that we keep track of our instructions and that the accumulator is kept up to date all the time. So that's the fetch, decode, execute phase in a very brief summary. The next thing to think about is what will affect our fetch decode execute cycle and the speed of it. We've got a series of performance factors. These three were named in the specification. We've got the clock speed. So what is the clock speed? Well, a clock is the time taken between two pulses of an oscillator. Now you don't really need to know what that means, but it just keeps a very steady time rhythm. And when you buy a processor, it will come in a series of gigahertz and that will tell you how fast and how many clock cycles you can do on your processor. If it's in gigahertz, you're talking billions of clock cycles per second. 
So the fetch execute cycle is triggered by clock pulses of the system clock. Every clock cycle itself will be a fetch decode execute. You move on to the next clock cycle, that will be fetch decode execute, and so on and so forth. A billion times a second. The faster the clock speed, the faster a computer can fetch, decode, and execute those instructions, and that means the clock can change its state many billions of times a second and that's useful for you as a user because as you request new things like you open new windows or new applications we can adapt to that because we're doing many billions of clock cycles per second. The other thing to think about is the number of cores. So how many cores does your processor have? Many computers today including personal computers have multiple cores whether that's dual core, quad core or octa core. Each core, theoretically, is able to process a different instruction at the same time with its own fetch, decode, execute cycle, making a quad-core computer or two or even four times faster than a single-core computer. The problem here is, if I said to you, I take a program and it takes an hour to execute this program, if I had four cores, would it take a quarter of the time? No, not always. It depends on whether the software has been written to take a full advantage of all four processors, or all, all two processors, for example. So more cores is great, and it will definitely speed up the processing time, but it doesn't always perfectly half or quarter your time taken to process. The third performance factor is cache memory. Now cache is a small amount of super fast but usually very expensive memory that stores data and instructions that have recently been used by the processor. And we can categorize cache into a series of levels. So level one cache is split into instruction cache and data cache so that data instructions can be fetched simultaneously. And that usually lives level one it usually lives directly next to your um, your CPU, or in your CPU, sorry. Um, and level two cache is usually larger, but not as fast as level one cache. Sometimes it's still on the, on the CPU chip, sometimes it's not. Then you've got both levels are held on the processor chip most of the time to bring everything together. The closer we are in proximity, the faster our transfer speeds. The more cache memory a computer has, the more likely it is that it won't have to wait to fetch the next instruction or data from random access memory where all our instructions stored. Remember at this point that we can't process anything unless it's been loaded into random access memory first, as it will always be, have to be loaded. So we keep our most frequently used information and instructions on cache memory. And that's usually for you and me, like a browser, for example. Now, for your second year students, we're looking at pipelining. So if you're an AS student, don't worry about this. But pipelining refers to a technique used in computer processors to improve system performance by allowing multiple instructions to be processed simultaneously in different stages of execution. Now the main bit here to remember is, while one instruction is being executed, another is being decoded. And yet another is being fetched, leading to more efficient use of the CPU and faster overall execution of programs. Now in English, all that means is, while, while you're going through your fetch, decode, execute cycle, if you fetch something, then you move on to the decode phase and wait and until you've decoded it, and then you move on to the execution phase and wait until it's been executed, and then start the process again, you're wasting quite a lot of time waiting. So what we do is as soon as we move past the fetch stage, we start fetching the next instruction and loading that data in while we're decoding and while we're executing. And that just speeds up the, the whole process. So pipelining helps reduce idle time in the processor, increasing instruction throughput. So, now we look at our different types of architectures.
the fetch decode execute cycle I've been taking you through mainly focuses on the von Neumann architecture. But there's another architecture called the Harvard architecture. So what's the difference? Well, clearly you can see here that memory looks a little bit different. In the von Neumann architecture, we have one memory module. And that one memory module shares instructions and data. And both the address bus and the data bus take information from that same mod memory module and passes it to the CPU. Whereas in Harvard architecture, you can see that those memory modules are now split. And you can see that we've got instruction address buses, instruction data buses, data data buses, and data address buses. And that means we're not waiting for one data to come from memory. And once that's finished, we go to addresses. So we don't wait for that to happen. And that's one of the major benefits. So let's have a look at those benefits of both systems. So benefits of the von Neumann architecture. Well, usually it's cheaper to develop as control system, the control system is less complex. That's less architecture, it's less cables, it's less hardware. So that means it's cheaper to build, it's less physical space required, and it's best for a broad range of applications on the same machine. But with Harvard, it's you get a quicker execution because there's no need for the data bus to wait for the data between instructions because you've got separate buses. Instruction and data memories can be different sizes to reflect the actual use. So we can have different length instructions and different length data instructions. So it's best for things like embedded systems where speed of execution is really important, where we need information immediately. So you might be thinking risks, risk to life systems like traffic light systems, for example. That's exactly what Harvard would be used for. Now those two different architectures, there is a third one. Because the von Neumann architecture and Harvard architectures, they're quite old architectures to be fair, and modern day systems and modern day processors, they require data very quickly, they're very hungry. So, we can bring in a contemporary architecture. And what we mean by contemporary architecture is merging these two technologies for the best of both worlds. So modern CPU chips often incorporate aspects of both von Neumann and Harvard architectures. In desktop computers, there's one main memory for holding both data and instructions, and we know that's von Neumann. So what we do is we take random access memory, our one memory module, and use that as a von Neumann architecture. But in cache memory, located in the CPU itself, we divide our cache memory into instruction cache and data cache. So data and instructions are retrieved using a Harvard architecture. So you've got von Neumann in RAM, and then your cache memory looks like a Harvard architecture. So some digital signal processors have multiple parallel data buses. So two write and three read, for example, and one instruction bus. So digital signal processors take real world signals like voice and audio and video and temperature from sensors and pressures from sensors or position that have to be digitized and then mathematically manipulated. So great for Harvard architecture because digital signal processing is quite complex, especially when we're taking real world analog information and digitizing it. So just remember, von Neumann, one memory module, Harvard, two memory modules. Harvard, separate buses. Von Neumann, single bus. Von Neumann has to wait for sending instructions or data. Harvard doesn't have to. Von Neumann is cheaper. Harvard's a little bit more expensive. Contemporary architectures are the mixing of both of those. Random access memory for Von Neumann, cache memory for Harvard architecture. So, let's move on to the next part then. The difference between CISC and RISC processors, so a different type of processor now, GPUs and their performance, 
and what that's all about. You've probably heard of GPUs before, and then multi-core and parallel systems. Again, the A2 content is part B here with GPUs and their uses. So if you're an AS student, you don't have to pay attention to that second part. Okay, this is an area that confuses quite a lot of students. So I've tried to make this as simple as possible. When we talk about CISC, we're talking about complex instruction set computers. With RISC, we're talking reduced instruction set computers. So with CISC, when we've got complex instruction sets, if you look at the example on the right hand side, there's a command there. Let me just get my pen. There we go. So you've got a command that says mult A and B. And what that does is that's one command that multiplies A and B. Nothing crazy there, is it? Okay. If you look underneath, you've got the same thing, multiplying two numbers. But you've got four lines of what we call assembly language programming. Load, register 1, A. Load, register 2, B. Multiply, register 1 with register 2. And then store the result of register 1, A. So that seems to be a lot more complicated. And if you look at the top, complex instruction sets. That is a complex command that's doing four lines of assembly. That's what that's doing. And that's why we call it complex instruction sets. So inside our CISC processors, you have a large number of commands, which are quite complex, but it uses fewer lines of assembly as possible. It combines the load and store commands into just one command. So load and store together will just be accumulated into one command. It could take multiple clock cycles because we don't know how many steps are needed for mult A and B. It could be four, it could be more, it could be less. So we don't know, it's unpredictable. Now the advantage is to using a CISC processor is that it's quicker to code programs. The compiler has very little work to do to translate a high level language statement into machine code. Because the code is relatively short, very little RAM is needed. So that's great. Now. It is great, but now we have an abundance of RAM because it's, we're in 2024 when this video was made and RAM is fairly cheap and abundant in our computers. So modern systems use reduced instruction set computers and that has a small number of simple commands. LDA, LDA, MULT, STO, okay? Small, simple commands. Each line of assembly takes exactly one clock cycle. So if I asked you how many clock cycles is going to be performed here, you would give me the answer of one, two, three, and four. Four clock cycles. Now that's fantastic. That's really helpful because that allows for pipelining to be done. Remember, pipelining is fetching while decoding and executing at the same time. The advantages of risk is that the hardware is simpler to build with fewer circuits needed for carrying out complex instructions. And because we've got less hardware or more simple hardware, it tends to be cheaper. Because each instruction takes the same amount of time, i.e. one clock cycle, pipelining is possible, and RAM is now so cheap in modern computers, relatively speaking, that RISC uses a lot more RAM and software allows better performance processes processors at less cost. So in effect, using RISC, although it uses more RAM, it's still cheaper to use in the long run. So let's look at our A2 content now and we look at GPUs and their uses. So not only are they used for graphics, you might have heard of GPUs being used for cryptocurrency and crypto mining. A graphics processing unit is a specialized electronic unit. Technically, it's a coprocessor. It does things in addition to your main processor, but it's separate. And that's why it usually comes as a big bulky unit that plugs into your PCI slot. Uh, it's very efficient at manipulating computer graphics and image processing because you've got to think about what they are and you boil them down. It's just lots of number crunching vectors and what light's doing and lots of physics, etc. So it's just a bunch of numbers. So it works in conjunction 
conjunction with your standard CPU and can process large blocks of visual data simultaneously. And that's why it's used for gaming and crypto mining. So you have many, many more cores inside your GPU and they, are, they work in a very different way than your CPU, but they do a lot of cross parallel processing. And obviously with the modern advantage of AI that we've got nowadays, GPUs are com becoming more readily available and more expensive at the moment anyway. So, speaking of multi-core and parallel systems, let's talk about what that means. A multi-core processor is able to distribute the workload of a single program across multiple processor cores, thus achieving significantly higher performance by performing several tasks in parallel. And that's why they're called parallel systems. Multiple cores, so on my screen here, I've got four cores. And each core has level one, level two cache built onto the chip. Four cores, great. That's like having four little mini processors. That's exactly what it is. Now when they all perform part of a task, they are working in parallel. Because I'm doing that one task at the same time across four cores. So the only drawback to this is that it's great but not all programs are actually specialized to take advantage of multiple cores. So while it does give you an advantage, again, like I said before, it doesn't quarter the problem or resolve the time issue because not all programs make use of multiple cores. Games and, and things like that on GPUs, they are definitely specialist pieces of software that would make use of multiple cores. So I mentioned this word before, a coprocessor, and a coprocessor is just an extra processor used to supplement the functions of the primary processor. And again, this is A2 content only. It may be used to perform things like floating point arithmetic, graphics processing, digital signal processing again, and other functions. It generally carries out only a limited range of functions. And like I said, it's tricky to write this. It's really, really difficult to write software to take advantage of those multiple cores. And that's why we get quite a large price for coprocessors and multi-core systems. And that's the end of 1.1.2. Let's move on to the third and final part of the specification in this unit. And that's input and output and storage devices. So this, this whole section here is for both AS and A2 students. So how different input and output and storage devices can be applied to the solution of different problems, the use of magnetic flash and optical storage, so just three secondary storage devices. We've got RAM and ROM, which are primary storage and virtual storage. So again, a little summary, let's jump straight in. Input devices. All input devices transfer data from one source in the outside world to the computer, usually through a peripheral device, but not always. Output devices take data produced by a computer and turn it into a human readable form in the form of visual, audio, or movement actions. Input devices consist of things like keyboards, keypads, barcode readers, microphones, scanners, touch screens, interactive whiteboards, or even sensors. And we're gonna look at a few different areas in just a second. Output devices are printers, things like ink, laser, dot matrix printers, 3D printers nowadays, actuators, speakers, and monitors, focusing on um, LCD, OLED, and LED. So let's take a look at some of these input devices. Let's start with sensors, yeah. So many sensors. Sensors are built into so many different devices nowadays, you probably never realized what these sensors actually are. Your phone contains tons of sensors that anyone, you or me, app developers can make use of. So we've got things like light sensors on top of um, street lights. We've got magnetic field sensors, moisture and humidity sensors. We've got temperature sensors in your heating systems. We've got acoustic sensors, gas sensors, pH sensors, pressure sensors, and even infrared sensors also. All of them take information in. And with those sensors, we can put them in hardware devices and use programming and software to do something with them. 
So we've got two different areas where we might use sensors in monitoring systems or controlling systems. So if I said to you, sensors monitor data, that would just say that data is taken in and the computer or microcontroller, which is just a small automated computer, simply reports the values to you somewhere else. You can be halfway across the world, providing you've got an internet connection, usually you can get access to the monitoring information and your sensors would keep you continually updated about what's happening. Now, if we took that information about what's continually happening and then outputted something from it and altered a process, that becomes an action. And actions mean control. So, for example, a temperature sensor takes the temperature information in my greenhouse. That's fed into a computer. If the temperature is too high or it's more than the acceptable limit, then we turn the motor on, which opens the window and cools the greenhouse down. So through that process, you've got a series of monitoring information about the temperature and then control, which opens the windows using an actuator or a motor. So let's move on to different output devices then. So the ones I focused on here are 3D printers. I find these are absolutely fascinating. We've got a number of different areas that 3D printers work in. You've got healthcare and medicine, building prosthetics or bioprinting. We've got aerospace and automotive engineering where we can build parts for different aircraft. And also things like in the International Space Station, there's a 3D printer. We can print parts up in space. Prototyping, so building of buildings and architectural plans. We can then have a look at them. We can even build entire homes out of concrete or plastic with a 3D printer. We have education and research, food industry, printing food using edible inks, and also robotics and drones with custom parts and even military applications, which we've seen. A couple more input devices. One that tends to catch a lot of people out the actuator that I was talking about before. An actuator you've probably seen before. So on the left there, you'll see an image of a door that opens automatically when you go near it. So there's a proximity sensor or a motion sensor that then triggers the actuator to open. Also, you can find them on things like aircraft. So an aileron on an aircraft controls the aircraft in the roll. So whether it's moving left or right, we see them in there as well. All good for when you've got autopilot on. So a couple more output devices, monitors. Those three that I talked about before, just wanted to go a little bit more into those. OLED stands for organic light emitting diode, LCD, liquid crystal display, or even LED light emitting diodes. I broke it down to four different areas just to keep it simple. The backlight of your TV, the color accuracy, the response time, and the cost. OLED has no backlight because each pixel emits its own light itself. LCD requires a backlight, and that's usually an LED behind the LCD itself. LED has a backlight. It's used to illuminate the pixels. On OLED, the color accuracy is excellent because you've got deep colors and true blacks because each actual pixel is doing it itself with its light. LCD is good but it's limited by backlighting and LED is decent depending on the quality of the backlighting. Some cheaper TVs not so good, some really high-end TVs very good. Response time, OLED if you're a gamer that's where you need to go. LCD you have a slower response time compared to OLED and LED has a faster than LCD but slower than OLED so that's the middle contender. When it comes to cost, OLED tends to be more expensive, LCD is less expensive than OLED, and LED itself is more affordable than OLED. So there's a quick summary for you. Now we do talk about different systems that are mixed also. So whether that is RFID, for example. So radio frequency ID, you've probably seen it before in your um, contactless card, for example, or paying with your phone. Um, and there's a few uh, examples on here of RFID, even on 
your supermarket cheese. Yes, behind that security protected sticker is an RFID chip and it is called passive RFID because it doesn't have any battery source. It actually gets activated by another energy source from somewhere else. So when that goes over the person's um, scanner at the checkout, that will activate the security protected label and deactivate it to say, don't go off because it's been paid for don't go off at the alarm when you go through the door. These ones, the cards, these are also passive as well. Um, these contactless cards here are also passive, which are activated by the machine below. And these ones do have a battery inside them, and they are called active RFID. Now, with a battery, you can basically increase the range. So these will signal off to a device that's located somewhere, whether it's in your home or you know, whether it's in your school or college or whatever. Um, and also, if you think about mixed input systems and output, you've got a screen here which displays output, but it also you can touch it, touch screen. So it's input, same with a phone. And also, you might not think about it, but a printer, a multifunction device. Here, you've got a touch screen, you've got a scanner, and you've got a printer. So you've got more input and output devices included in there. Nearly then now, we've got primary and secondary storage. So on your screen, you can see exactly what we've been through. We've been through input devices. We've been through output devices. We've been through the central processing unit. And all we've got now is storage devices, secondary storage, and primary memory. So let's get stuck in with secondary storage. Three that were named in the specification. We have hard disk drives, solid state drives, and optical storage. When I refer to secondary storage, these are devices that are used to store data permanently. So when a computer is switched off, they can be internal. So located inside the computer or external, which is generally used to move data between computer systems. Now hard disk drives are referred to as magnetic, solid state drives are referred to as SSD or flash memory and optical it's just your, your classic CD, compact disc. So, taking the first one, hard disk drives. These, the first thing you would say in an exam is that they have moving parts. The moving parts are because the magnetic discs inside them spin round and it's measured in revolutions per minute. It records information by magnetizing regions on the disc to represent binary ones and zeros. Hard disk drives have moving parts, making them slower and less durable. So if you drop them, chances are your data is going to corrupt because your read-write head is going to touch the disk platter itself. So they're less ideal for portable devices due to their size and also their fragility. Okay, But they do offer large storage capacities at lower costs. So you've got some key characteristics there. High capacity, low cost per gigabyte, um, so you get a large amount of data, and also they're fragile and they're slow in comparison to flash memory. Now it's interesting to point out here why they're still around. They're still around because the read-write head hovers just three to 10 nanometers above the surface of the spinning disk. Three to 10 nanometers is ridiculously close to the surface of the disk. So small in fact, that the human hair is about 80 to 100,000 nanometers thick, making the gap remarkably small, which is why they're not very durable. So if you drop them or push, kick them around or bang them, etc., chances are that read-write head that you see there is gonna touch the disc. And there's the read-write head there. It's just a small electromagnet. Now you don't need to know that for your exam, but it's pretty interesting. So let's move on then to Optical storage, we jump into disks. So optical storage is a method of storing data using light. So typically, you will use lasers on the disk to burn, read and write information on a disk surface. So we've got common um, types of optical, such as CD, DVD, Blu-ray discs, which store data as patterns of tiny pits and lands. So a pit is where it's burnt out, and a land is where it's not burnt out. And it does that on the disk's reflective surface. And the data is read by shining a laser onto the disk and detecting the light reflections. 
Optical storage is really good because it's portable, inexpensive, it's durable. We can send lots of software on disks, um, but it does have a slow read-write speed and a lower storage capacity compared to modern alternatives like solid-state drives. So it's cheap per gigabyte, lightweight, portable, slow access times, and prone to damage. And finally, our third and final secondary storage device, the classic solid-state drive. And this is where we are now, modern day. Solid-state drive uses flash memory to store data with no moving parts. It uses NAND, so that's knotted AND flash memory to read and write data electronically, making it much faster and much more durable than traditional hard drives. No moving parts whatsoever. SSDs offer quick boot times, faster data access, and better reliability, especially for portable devices due to the shock resistance. Now they are more expensive per gigabyte. Fair enough. They do provide a higher performance and are commonly used in modern laptops, PCs, and high performance systems. They are durable, fast access. They cost more per gigabyte and they do have a limited read and write lifespan. Now on the right hand side there you can see as well, we do have C different forms of solid state drive. This is a SD or a disk here, well, a one terabyte tiny SanDisk Extreme secure digital SD card. Um, we also have these here which are uh, USB memory sticks. Bear in mind in your exam, do not just put USB because it means a, a universal serial bus and that is not a memory device. So, in your exam, you can break secondary storage down to four key broad categories. Durability, I say four, I've written five there, oh dear. Secondary storage can be discussed in five broad categories. Durability, cost per gigabyte, speed, size, in memory terms, and also its portability. And you can see there, a really expensive eight terabyte M.2 SSD. That is the most modern one I could find and the fastest transfer speed I could find also. Pretty impressive stuff that if you compare it to hard disk drive. So, primary memory, yes. So what is primary memory? Primary memory means this is the first memory before we put it into the CPU. So random access memory is a type of primary or main memory. It's volatile, which means if you turn the power off, then you'll lose all the data. So that makes it a temporary storage module. It does have fast short-term access to data, allowing applications and the operating system to run efficiently. RAM loses all the data when the computer is powered off, and we call that volatile memory. The more random access memory a system has, the more programs it can run simultaneously without slowing down. We need lots of RAM in multi-core systems, and RAM plays a crucial role in overall system performance, but it is not used for long-term data storage because it's volatile. So high speed allows multitasking to happen, has direct access to the memory modules in there. It is volatile and it is a limited capacity. When we compare that to read-only memory, read-only memory is non-volatile, which means it will permanently store essential data and instructions like your firmware. And you need that for your device to function. We also have boot programs on there, which enable us to start up our computer. Unlike random access memory, read-only memory retains the contents even when the power is turned off. Data in read-only memory is typically pre-programmed, so the things in your chips are already pre-programmed on there. And it cannot be easily altered or erased, which is a benefit. You don't want it to be erased, I suppose. However, that can also be a drawback, making it ideal for storing fixed instructions like the boot process. Read-only memory is widely used in computers, smartphones, and embedded systems to store the BIOS or other critical software. It's not volatile, it is stable and reliable, it comes pre-programmed, it's read-only, so it's not editable, and it does have another limited capacity. Now, what happens when we run out of random access memory? 
So here I am with my RAM chip and I've got my operating system, Word, Excel, Photoshop, other documents in use, and I want to open a browser. So what happens when RAM gets full? Well, we don't want to stop loading instructions because it will slow the computer down. We'll end up idling the CPU. We use something called virtual memory, and I guarantee you've probably never used it in your life because we've got random access memory now and plenty of it. But virtual memory is a system that allows a computer to use part of its secondary storage, its slow transfer speed, secondary storage, that's HDD, SSD, or even optical, but we're not using optical, as if it was extra RAM when the actual random access memory is full. So while virtual memory helps to keep programs running smoothly, accessing data from the hard drive is much slower than random access memory. So it can reduce performance and it does an awful lot. Modern systems usually don't have this issue because RAM is abundant. And when we move between random access memory and we use secondary storage as RAM, that's called disk thrashing. So when you have virtual memory open, use it. If you move back and forward between RAM and secondary storage to feed the CPU, disk thrashing it's called, and it is a nightmare. It slows your system down an awful, awful lot. So that's all the information as a summary. What do you need to do now? Just by watching this video will not help you out. You need to now take what you've learned in this video and start to put it somewhere. And there's a number of different things you can do. If you're a, one of my students in our Google Classroom, you will have access to all the exam questions from this topic. Practice them. Just remember that when you move away from this video now, you'll probably forget most after a couple of weeks. So you've got to repeat, 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 repeat. Go over the information again to form newly learned information in your brain. You can also use flashcards like we do in lesson, get someone to test you. You can use the Pomodoro method, which is short but intense time. So work for 25 minutes, five minute break. Work for 25 minutes, five minute break. Or you can get somebody, somebody to test you. You can do low stakes testing or quizzing like Google Forms or Kahoot. Or you can even look at other methods like the two, three, five, seven method, where you build a decent revision um, structure and you follow that for revision. Okay, that's it from me. Quite a long video. I'll break it down to chapters and I'll see you again in the next one.